Lenny, it's great to see you. How have you been coping during this global pandemic? I know you've been in the Bahamas. It's been a very eye-opening time, uh, a time to get more in touch with myself, uh, a time for deep creativity, reflection, uh, exercising, living in the moment. Uh, it's been it's been really wonderful. Uh, I'm sorry that it's at the expense of people's health, people's lives. Um, but this is where I ended up. I I, I left Paris uh, on March fourth, and uh, I was meant to come here for five days uh, before going on to Australia and New Zealand to continue my world tour, and then everything started to, you know, unfold. And so I've been here uh, the entire time, yeah. You've been writing your memoir, Let yeah. Love Cool, of course, the title of your debut album, and you've just recently released it to an incredibly positive reaction, New York Times bestseller. Well, first of all, were you surprised by the reaction? And also, why did you decide this was the time to write it? I was extremely uh, surprised. This is not anything that I ever thought about doing. Uh, and when I did, I didn't, I mean, I don't know what kind of reaction I expected. I didn't expect any really. Um, I've been working on this for the last few years, uh, about three or four years, but that's really on and off. There's times where I didn't write for, you know, eight months uh, because of touring and because of trying to figure out uh, how I was gonna write this book. Uh, I had to find my voice and that took a moment. But uh, I met David Ritz, uh, who guided me through this book and helped me with this book. Uh, and uh, he, we met at a dinner and he said, you should write a book. And I, I knew who he was. I knew his books. I respect him very much. He's written some of the most incredible books uh, about musicians and artists, uh, from Ray Charles to Marvin Gaye to Aretha Franklin. And uh, by the end of this dinner, he had convinced me to write this book. Um, and I took, it, I took it as a challenge, I think. But I'm really glad that I did because in writing this book, I got so much out of it. And, you know, the, the main thing was a, a lot of healing. Lenny, was it therapeutic for you to write about your first 25 years? And tell me about the difficult relationship you had that you write about with your father, Sai. It came quite naturally because, you know, I, I tell the truth in my art. And if I was going to write this book, I was going to, you know, let it all out, you know? And uh, yes, I had a very interesting and challenging relationship with my father. But through writing this book, I got to back away from him. And I got to see him as a character on a page. And I realized that he was just a man doing the best he could with what he had, trying to get through this life experience. And he did love me and uh, he did love my mother, but he had he had issues, he had, he had things that, you know, uh, he never got to deal with in his life. And, and so he did certain things, but uh, any, any, any feelings that I had uh, toward my father that were negative, he just evaporated uh, in the process of writing this book. And, and that was a wonderful thing. And I, and I got to, feel differently about him. I got to actually love him in a way that I didn't get to love him when he was alive. Uh, through writing this book, I, 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 got, I got a deeper understanding of this man's character. And he did, you know, expose me to amazing things growing up. And, you know, I had the father that I needed. I, I, you know, that was the man that I needed in my life for me to become who I was gonna become. I needed that challenge. And Lenny, of course, your mother, Roxy Roker, was a very famous actress at the time. And you grew up, they were an interracial couple. But yes. you say in the book 
that you didn't realize that anything was different until you went to first grade and one of your fellow pupils pointed this out what happened yeah you know i grew up in a house where you know my father is a a white you know russian jew my mother black afro-caribbean woman christian woman and we had everything in between uh, because you know they were artists in new york city in the late 60s and of course you know, they mixed with everybody. And so our house had every color, every background in it from the time I can remember. And so I just understood that that's what life was. I didn't know anything about the differences of people and that that was an issue in the world. I was sheltered from that, um, not on purpose, just by the way we lived. And so, yes, when I went to first grade, my parents walked me to school on the first day as parents do. And as it seemed, I guess that morning, my parents were the only ones that didn't match. And so this kid ran out in front of the three of us, stopped, pointed his finger at us and yelled, uh, your father's white and your mother's black. And it was a thing. And I didn't understand why he was making this scene and what was the point. And that's when conversations of race and what, what the world was like really started happening uh, between my mother and I. Yeah. But it was beautiful to grow up that way and not understand that, not having an idea about racism. Well, of course, that is so much part of what the global debate is today, mm. Lenny. Systemic racism everywhere. Mm. What is your take on it? And do you feel disappointed that the world hasn't moved on further? My take on it is that it's sad and we are more intelligent. We have the capacity to get along, uh, despite our differences. You know, we're all different. That's what makes the world beautiful. We all have our ways, our customs, our religion, our backgrounds, and, and why we can't live with that and just respect the other person's life and live our life uh, is beyond me. Um, what I find sad is that if you would have asked me 30 years ago if I thought the world would be in a better place than it was when I first wrote my first album, Let Love Rule, in speaking about a lot of these issues, I would have told you, yes, I believe the world, you know, we're, we're going to, it's, it's a slow climb, but we are going there. And it just amazes me where we are today, that we've slipped uh, into this place. Now, it's always been here, but people feel that they have a platform now. Um, and feel more confident in, in, in saying how they feel and acting how they feel. Uh, but, you know, I watched my grandparents, I watched my parents struggle and, 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 and fight for the good things, you know, for equality, et cetera. And uh, if they were here today, they would not understand where we are. They wouldn't understand it. Do you feel that the current administration has handled it well? You, you've encouraged people to go out and vote. I don't want to make it an American thing because this is a global issue uh, between human beings. Um, what can we do? Those of us that know what is right and true need to continue to represent what that is. And the youth, which I'm, I'm very, very proud of the youth, uh, of the young people around the world that are standing up and that are really, uh, you know, doing what I saw in the, in, the, in the 70s, you know, from looking back at my parents and their friends who were marching and standing up and, and, and protesting peacefully. Um, I love seeing that because the youth know these are, these are old ways. These are old ways that are being passed down and taught to the, to the new generation of people, um, which is keeping racism and all of these different uh, things alive. So, you know, whatever administration, whatever country in the world, um, it's about us. It's about the people. And we have to uh, represent. Are you disappointed by some of the global leaders? Oh, yes, of course. I mean, I, I don't. Again, I, I've never understood it. I mean, uh, politics is politics. That's what it is. And there are people that do better than others. And there are people that are, are 
more positive than others, but at the end, at the end of the day, it's still politics and things don't happen as quickly as they should. Um, you know, our main concerns right now, uh, need to be our planet and ourselves, how we are treating ourselves and each other. And we don't have time to wait to get through all of this tape. Uh, we need to have action now. And if we don't, uh, Mother Nature will deal with us. Lenny, of course, you left home mm. very young at 16 over an argument with your father because you, you wanted to go to see the drummer Buddy Rich. Uh, and he wouldn't allow you. And you ended up being very independent at such a young age. Mm. What impact do you think that had on your life? That was my education. That was my college education. Uh, you know, I understood that if you're going to stay at home, you must adhere to the rules of the house. And, um, and I respect that. And, and, you know, that's the way I grew up. Um, but yes, my father and I got into this heated argument. I wanted to go see this musician play. He didn't want me to go. I really wanted to go. And I understood that if I went, that would be that. I wouldn't be welcomed back into the home because I would have broken the rules. So I left. I packed a bag. I, I jumped in my friend's car with this duffel bag, not having any idea where I was going to go. But that, that night led to many years of an adventure that taught me so much about life, about people, uh, and was, was the path of me finding my voice and my expression. And it was, it was incredible. And I'm very, very blessed that those years I spent in the streets and living in cars and people's floors and couches and hiding away in places. Um, I'm very fortunate that, that bad things did not happen to me. You know, I always had these guardian angels looking out for me and met these people along my way that, that looked out for me. I mean, I had situations, but nothing, nothing horrible, you know, and that's where I learned about people and, uh, and life. And, uh, it was invaluable. I'm, I'm very glad that I did that. You also said no to a lot of record labels that mm -hmm. were offering to sign you, which is amazing to think because, as you say, you were living in cars. How did you have that self-belief to know when the right one came along and the right time? It's really interesting because at that time I hadn't found my voice yet, but I knew what these executives wanted me to do was not. And uh, I wanted a record deal badly. I want, this is what I wanted. And these people were offering, you know, contracts and money and, you know, promising, uh, you know, fame and whatever it is that they tell you. And when it came time to sign and the pen was in my hand, I felt physically ill. I knew that this was something that I should not be doing. That was the voice inside of me. That was, you know, whatever you want to call it. And I did, you know, if you ask me today, how did I do that? I don't know because when you're 16, 17, 18 years old and you're being offered these deals and you're living out, you know, from pillar to post, as my grandmother used to say, um, it, you look quite crazy not taking the opportunity. But I, I think the spirit inside of me knew that this was not my path. And, uh, it's quite amazing that I was able to do that. Uh, and uh, when I did find my way years later, I understood why it all came together. Had I have taken those deals then, um, I don't believe that I'd be sitting here speaking with you. My life would have gone in another direction. And uh, what that taught me was that, you know, in life we have many open doors uh, that we see along our path, but it doesn't mean that you should walk through all of them, you know? Some of them are to look through and see and understand that that's not the way to go. And that applies to all of us in our lives, whatever it is, you know, follow, following our spirit uh, is so important. And we live in a world where we're being constantly told from birth what to do and what not to do and how to do it. And, uh, you know, we, we, we get pulled away from, from, from that, you know, from listening to ourselves and trusting in ourselves. Lenny, also in the book, you talk about the meeting with uh, Lisa Bonet, who's obviously the mother of your daughter, Zoe, and, and uh, you 
amicably divorced, so much so that uh, you have, um, it looks like a very friendly relationship with her husband, Jason Momoa. Now, what was the impact of meeting Lisa at that time? It was, it was huge. It was, it was, an, it was me meeting someone that I felt was from my tribe. Um, I understood her, she understood me. I felt that we were mirror images of each other. And I was able to, through that experience, learn so much about myself through her. Uh, that was a major part of whatever energies needed to come together um, that opened that portal for me where my expression started coming out in the true way that it needed to through our love, through our life, through our world that we created and the friends and the, you know, our, 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 our surroundings allowed that to come out. It was nurtured. And um, as far as, yes, being a family, uh, we, we, we are one uh, beautiful family and uh, we, are, we are all extremely tight and have each other's backs and love each other unconditionally. And uh, I'm, I'm blessed that, that uh, I can live that way and that we can have that experience uh, and continue to love uh, just in a different dynamic. You've achieved so much in your career so far and in so many different areas. Can you highlight maybe one of the proudest moments of your life or career so far? You know, I kind of look at it all as one big thing, but uh, being, being able to have achieved uh, some level of, success, and that doesn't mean money or fame, just success as in becoming myself. Uh, my mother got to see uh, a few years of that. And that for me uh, makes me happy because she was able to see uh, some of that before she passed on. And so for me, that, that, that's very close to my heart. We were talking initially about how the pandemic has affected everyone's lives. How do you feel it's going to affect the music industry and live performances? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to be a moment before people are playing in packed arenas and stadiums. You know, you see people trying to do smaller gigs, uh, socially distanced, you know, um, and that's, that's a good start. And, but that's not what a concert experience is. A concert experience for me in my concerts is, you know, 20, 30, 50, 100,000 people, whatever it may be, coming together, uh, smashed up against each other, feeling each other, um, you know, riding this wave of music and love and unity. And it's going to be, it's going to be a while before we have that again. So, you know, how else are we going to do it? I don't know. I mean, we're doing all kinds of things now through the computer, obviously. Uh, it's completely different. <laughs> um, but uh, for me, the thing is just to, to stay creative. I'm recording a lot right now. And hopefully in the next, you know, year or two, when, when we can return to that, uh, I'll have lots of new material and uh, I'll be ready. I, I miss it very much. And finally, at the end of the book, it says mm -hmm. to be continued. Are you thinking about the second one? And what message do you want everyone to take away from Let Love Rule, your memoir? I'm thinking about the second book, yes. I, 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 need, I need to take a breath, uh, but it's something that I'm thinking about. I wasn't sure that I would, uh, even though I said to be continued, but uh, I, I think it's something that I will tackle for the, for the sheer reason uh, you know, of continued understanding and healing uh, in my life. I, it, writing, these, writing this book was the greatest form of therapy I've ever had, you know? And I think that would be really great to have for this next chapter uh, in my life where things became quite difficult um, and amazing. Um, and as far as... Uh, taking away, you know, a message from the book. I mean, I think it's really about uh, someone finding their their purpose and having the 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 vision and the confidence to to stay on course. And that I think that's the most 
one of the most important things for all of us to do, to become who God intended us to become. Whatever our gifts are, whatever our, that is, you know, we, I believe we all have uh, unique gifts and a purpose. We just have to stay on course. Well, Lenny, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope to see you in the Bahamas again soon. I had an amazing time with you last time. Well, I hope so too. I can't wait to get there again. Thank you so much, Lenny.